as well. Yeah. How come does um, the regular media does not um, you know warns us about this or tells us about this? Uh, what's happening? Because this is a rather um, you know. Yeah. Well, uh, that's a good question. Well, a lot of the media is supported by advertising from companies like McDonald's and companies like that. But you know that's kind of a cop out answer in a way because mm -hmm. we could educate. <coughs> sorry, we could educate McDonald's and some of those companies. Mm -hmm to start offering, just like they've started doing with offering B.O. products and things like that. Mm -hmm. Now we have a B.O. burger or things like that. Because if they make money off of it, they'll sell mm -hmm. it. So you need to educate the consumer to be interested enough and asking for the, to the ask for it and problem, demand yeah. it. And so then it will start to be offered mm -hmm. no matter what. Because mm -hmm. I don't buy that argument that they're all out to kill us or to make mm -hmm. us infertile. They aren't. Uh, to illustrate the power of uh, the, the, the consumer, basically, <clears throat> Uh, maybe you can tell about uh, the example of the um, bovine growth hormone? Yeah, well, the bovine growth hormone is a good example because so many people stood up on their, <coughs> sorry, on their hind legs mm -hmm. and objected to the use of uh, the BSG meat that they stopped using it wherever they could. Uh, I mean, it's still, still, there's some use of it some places, but generally it's been greatly reduced. Yeah, but yeah. is providing guidelines, which right. are uh, what what uh, from the guidelines towards the um, uh, enforcement, basically. How does the legislation work trickle down, if you mm -hmm. will, uh, through to the national government and yeah. to the local supermarket and factory? How does it work? Well, in general, uh, with Codex, you know, it doesn't have any direct enforcement powers. Mm -hmm. So you're hitting on an interesting point here, and that is. Um, the guidelines are being created, and keep in mind it's not a monolithic thing with just one guideline. There are hundreds of guidelines on mm -hmm. different things from natural mineral waters to, like I was saying, aluminum in foods to uh, aspartame mm -hmm. to all sorts of different standards being created. But how do they get put into effect? Well, it really depends on the country. But a lot of people are tied, a lot of people, a lot of countries are tied into the codex standards mm -hmm. through trade agreements, <coughs> through uh, like the sanitary and phytosanitary mm -hmm. agreement, the technical barriers to trade agreement, which all of these countries, almost all of these countries are signatories, the EU, the US, the UK, uh, Nor Norway, Canada, South America, and countries and the mm -hmm. like are, are all signatories to this and these commit them mm -hmm. to implementing domestically in their legislation mm -hmm. uh, and in their own laws and in mm -hmm. their own regulations, the codex standards. So mm -hmm. it's tied in that way. And then what happens is, <clears throat> as people become increasingly familiar with the uh, codex mm -hmm. laws, as the legislators do, then they start writing it into the laws mm -hmm. as well. And they've started doing that in the US and Canada, mm -hmm. where they directly refer to codex alimentarius. Mm -hmm. So, um, has there been any uh, national government resistance to codex uh, guidelines? You know, so like a government saying, "Well, uh, we don't like this particular guideline. We sort of like skip it." Or, uh, mm -hmm. well, that's uh, another interesting question because it used to be written in the codex procedural manual mm -hmm. up until about three or four years ago <coughs> that each government had the right, each member state mm -hmm. of codex had the right to either accept, reject, or accept with reservations mm -hmm. any codex standards. And then mysteriously, mm -hmm. and again, NHF was one of the, I think we were the only ones to mm -hmm. object to it at the General Principles Committee mm -hmm. meeting in Paris in 2006, I believe it was, could have been 2007, to object to the removal mm -hmm. of that language, of that par part of the procedural manual. And now, there's nothing, there's no acceptance rejection, <coughs> excuse me, rejection or acceptance with reservations mm -hmm. rights there. Um, is the Codex Elementarius Commission encountering any national government resistance? Not really. I mean, there was a time when the South African government offered resistance on certain issues, but in general, no, no they all like what Codex is doing. Mm -hmm. So the national resistance is non existent. The, in fact, some of the third world countries, the developing world as we say these days, are 
such so eager to adopt the standards, or even adopting them for their own national legislation before Codex finalizes them, before Codex itself adopts them. So it's a real, real issue. Okay. Okay. And can any individual persons or companies find any uh, remedy in court? You know, if they encounter um, a, a new legislation that is due to of, of thing, mm -hmm. come into existence thanks to Codex Elementaris, can they find any remedy in court? You know, an object or well, I would say I? I would say in most countries no. In the United States, maybe Canada, there are some remedies, but they'd be very expensive, and the likelihood of a favorable outcome is pretty slim, mm -hmm. pretty low. Yeah. So uh, it's a practical matter, probably not. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't hurt to try. You never can tell if you won't win or not. So sure. uh, just as long as you have the money and the people behind mm -hmm. you, you could launch a, a challenge and see. Yeah. Because in the U.S. it certainly violates some constitutional rights. Mm -hmm. And it certainly violates the division, the separation of powers amongst the states mm -hmm. and the federal government. But in other countries, except for maybe Canada, you don't really have that kind of a protection. Mm. So, and the courts these days are so corrupt in terms of what they would uh, allow a citizen to bring as a lawsuit uh, that it's unlikely a court judge would rule favorably anyway. They wouldn't follow the law in other words. Yeah. Uh, what is the relation of the Codex Elementarius with the um, Euro Commission? Uh, uh, and the uh, EU directives and the Obama healthcare system. Is there sort of like um, uh, legislation coming from or guidelines coming from the Codex Elementaris that influences both the European Commission and the Obama well, healthcare I, system? I, I, is, there, is there interaction good. going on? Uh, well, there's interaction on the formal and informal stage, but in terms of are they tied in legally, no they aren't. They're definitely separate systems, but what you find is with the, um, say, the EU food directives, the food supplement directive, uh, they, they tried to, <coughs> the European Union delegate tried to mirror the Codex Alimentarius food supplements mm -hmm. guideline right after the European Union Food Supplements Directive, even word for word, even to changing the title, which originally had been uh, the uh, food, uh, I'm sorry, had been the supplement uh, guideline mm -hmm. to food supplement guideline, mm -hmm. so it would correspond with and match the European Union's Food Supplements Directive. And the, they were quite successful at that because the head of the committee uh, for nutrition under Codex was a German, mm -hmm. and he was responded very favorably to the European Union's needs and wants and desires, and so he would pretty much give carte blanche to, mm -hmm. uh, to anything the EU directive, uh, sorry, EU delegate wanted, mm -hmm. and they would pass it, and so that's what's been going on. So there's a harmonization going on? There, there is, but it's less, it's not so much as formal that they have to do it, it's yeah. just that they see the common interests mm -hmm. and they do it. Okay. And so the same thing with the Obamacare that you mentioned, they yeah. see some common interests, and so they say, hey, we want to write uh, standards mm -hmm. or write law along the same way that they've mm -hmm. done with the Codex Elementarius Commission mm -hmm. in, the, in those areas where there is some overlap mm -hmm. or could be overlap, so they'll use that kind of language. Mm -hmm. Because things are becoming so globalized and so internationalized that instead of just looking to what's happening in Belgium or the Netherlands or the United States or Russia or whatever, they're saying, how is it going to impact us internationally? Mm -hmm. And then they'll, they'll look at the global implications. Yeah, so they try to uh, synchronize the local laws with they the really international do. guidelines. They do, because uh, they realize it's a bigger world out there than just mm -hmm. their own countries these yeah. days. Okay. Um, <laughs> what has been the effect of the Codex Elementarius on society so far? Do you have mm -hmm. any um, tangible um, example that you can say, well, we saw first this in a guideline and now it trickled down all the way to um, things that happening uh, locally? Well, it's really been much more subtle. I don't know if I could give one particular example, but just sort of the general feeling that things, like I was mentioning before, mm -hmm. 
have been become globalized. There are uh, not so much in the food supplement area, mm -hmm. it hasn't happened, certainly not in North America, or certainly not in the U.S., but in certain food trade like mm -hmm. uh, fruits and vegetables and things of that sort where they refer to international standards mm -hmm. in terms of labeling and the like, yeah, it's had some impact, but it's nothing that the consumer necessarily sees right away, um, at least not visibly so. Yeah. So, in terms of something that is hard and fast and that you could point to and say, yes, my life is so different now because of this, mm -hmm. there isn't anything right now that really exists like that. But that day is arriving. Mm -hmm. It's not far on the horizon, far from us on the horizon, mm -hmm. but that day is arriving. So, we could expect some sort of uh, uh, mark of approval on, on products or yeah. something like you, that? Uh, you already do see it a little bit. Sometimes in some, like I've seen it on some Turkish labeling and <clears throat> some others where they say mm -hmm. formulated or packaged in accordance with Codex Alimentarius. Okay. You've yeah. started to see some of that, but whether it, we really notice it in reading a, a label with a lot of words yeah. on it, you know, most people don't. Yeah. But so it's more like um, going top down from the companies on. Pretty so the much. companies have more. <clears throat> to do with the legislation that the consumer they do. Uh, will see, actually. Right. They do, and that's very well put, because they'll notice it much more than the average consumer. Yeah. Okay. okay. So they use, like, um, the, the, the leader? They really, on not on everything, but they certainly are on food supplements, they're the leader. Okay. Uh, and certain other areas as well, I mm -hmm. mean, mineral waters they are. <laughs> Some of the contaminants in food, uh, the CCF uh, committee that I mentioned mm -hmm. before, the Codex Committee on Contaminants in Food, they use clearly the leader there. But it's kind of funny, you see a rising now, the influence more of China mm -hmm. and India, they're being more assertive because it's tougher for them, well, not so much the Indians, mm -hmm. but the Chinese, because uh, to participate in these meetings mm -hmm. because they're conducted in either French, Spanish, or English. And by the time they get the interpretation, and then they filters through what did they mean, you know, and it's being interpreted into English, and then they have to do their own self-interpretation into Chinese. Well, they're already on to the next topic, and it's too late to object, or they didn't understand really what was going on. But an interesting change has been <clears throat> that of late, the Chinese and the Indians have been much more assertive, and so you see a more bipolar or multipolar world going mm -hmm. on at these meetings than before where it was just a yes man operation mm -hmm. between the EU delegate and the chairman or chairwoman of the committee. Sometimes the American or the Canadian mm -hmm. or the Australian or New Zealand delegates will have an impact because they're very vocal mm -hmm. but uh, and actually very well spoken, but uh, really it's the EU delegate that was the driving engine more mm -hmm. than anything else, and that's in the form of Basil Matthew Dacus. Mm -hmm. Which brings to another question <laughs> that is very interesting that your uh, viewers should perhaps know. So he was our arch enemy during the heyday of uh, fighting the food supplements uh, standard at Ooh. Codex. What's his name? Basil Matthew Dacus, a Greek gentleman who uh, is in, based here in Brussels and is um, and is the head of the delegation of the mm -hmm. EU delegation, then called the EC delegation. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it just changed its name last year, I think. Uh, EC stands for European in, Commission. Yes, yes, or European Community, I oh, think, community. in this yeah, case. Yeah, okay. And uh, he he was at the forefront of pushing through these standards mm -hmm. that, that the NHF, the National Health Federation, opposed very strongly. He and I used to have knockdown, down out arguments on the floor in 2003, 2004, 2005, uh, even 2006, mm -hmm. where we hated each other's guts virtually, but, uh, and, you know, just uh, a very bad exchange of words mm -hmm. as we fought this. Well, the funny thing is, now that he's gotten pretty much what he wants, which is at least the framework for the mm -hmm. food supplement standard, uh, 